Twenty-nine tubes ran out of the machine, warming their way into the tangle of wires and ducts. S.J. counted them and imagined where they might lead, who might be waiting on the other end. Why did you decide to do this? The man next to her asked. He was wearing a cheap button-down shirt, the sleeves still creased from the package. They'd been told to wait here before orientation. S.J. shrugged. I guess I wanted to make a difference, and this seemed as good a way as any. Creative expressions had been a fun area to study, but outside of the occasional commission or holographic display for lavish parties, it didn't pay well. Certification had only taken another year of training, and when S.J. had considered her options, something felt right about this one. Noble. What about you? she asked. I had a teacher once, he said, scratching his neck. He'd missed a spot shaving. Good old 57. And I thought, maybe if I could do that too. The machine door stood open. Inside was all screens and tubes and metal appendages. The man shifted nervously. But no one tells you these things. They really don't. They don't, S.J. agreed, and silently added that was probably intentional. She looked at the number posted above the metal pod that would be his. Hey, 207. Like 57. That's gotta be lucky. Hers was 208. An engineer in a flat, blue jumpsuit walked toward them, feet clunking on the metal grates hanging between the rows of machines. He handed them each a clipboard stacked high with papers. Sign these. He was wearing a helmet and goggles. S.J. and 207 had neither. S.J. reassured herself that he must work around other, more dangerous machinery. Engineering, 207 said vaguely as the engineer's footsteps clattered away. That's a good, solid, reliable choice. Engineers need teachers, too, S.J. said. There was too much to read, most of it unintelligible to anyone but legal representatives anyway. She skimmed instead, phrases like risk of bodily harm and not liable glaring up at her. She'd trained too long to turn back now. She penned her signature in one flourish. Jesus, 207 muttered next to her, flipping through the pages. Jesus. S.J. set her clipboard on a nearby air duct. I'm sure you get used to it. He looked dubiously at the machine that had started to hum and flicker. I don't know about that. I've heard some people lasted over 50 years. Anyway, it's exciting to think about. Shaping young minds. Hold on to that. Uh Uh-huh, 207 said, unconvinced. The internal voice is the key to shaping a well-balanced, mature child. 
By utilizing an internal source rather than an external one, educators tap directly into the psyche, shaping the subconscious. This method renders traditional, dedicated educational spaces and the corresponding societal obligations obsolete. Children learn from the space of the home under the direct and constant supervision of educators acting as instructor and conscience. The Little Voice Orientation consisted of gripping the rubber handles of the machine and hoping her brain didn't start running out her ears. A crowd of flat blue engineers had hooked her in with sensors and needles and probes, telling her to pay attention because she'd have to do it next time. Then, twenty-nine little lives flickered on around her. It was impossible to tell them apart. They were a blur of runny noses and sticky fingers, daydreams and changeable desires, all made worse by only being able to see their world and not them. The connection was only one way. It wouldn't do to have their first experience with the little voice be cursing and screaming. Slowly, Twenty-nine lives began to take shape. Sammy had a pet cactus and no front teeth, which gave her an endearing lisp and the eternal frustration that no one understood what she was saying. Theo, poor Theo, was leery of road signs. He'd seen a stop sign shaking on a corner once and thought it was going to hit him. S.J. made a mental note to discuss the wind as soon as possible. A cheerful text popped up on the display next to her, with a cloud spitting a yellow lightning bolt. Common phenomena of the physical world. Curriculum guidelines cycled through the screens. The next day the barrier came down. And when S.J. thought hello, 29 little minds erupted in excitement, eagerly saying hello back. Three weeks passed in a blur. Despite putting her nourishment IV in wrong one morning and almost passing out, she was getting used to it, enjoying it even. Her 29 little wards were located in the same time zone, so at least the nights were quiet. When only hazy, sticky dreams were coming through the tubes, S.J. detached and went back to her quarters. Quality accommodations provided, the promotional materials had said. They had not specified the kind of quality. Her room was a metal box with a squeaky bed, a kitchenette, a narrow desk, and a false window she could project images of anything or anywhere she wanted onto. A newly printed 3,000-page booklet was waiting for her on the table, full of the latest metrics and do and do nots for curriculum. S.J. stood on it to try to adjust the false window to anything other than static. She finally decided to pretend she was caught in a blizzard. The cold draft from the faulty air duct completed the effect. Administration had called a district-wide meeting that morning, temporarily cutting all student feeds to project a pre-recorded video of a lean, balding man standing in front of a rose bush and thanking them for their hard work, telling them that preliminary metrics on student progress were looking good, reminding them that children are important, telling them that due to staffing problems, the dawn-to-dusk shifts would be continuing for the foreseeable future, mentioning that 
student load might have to increase. It's in there or in this together, administration said. Administration was capable of direct mind links. Administration didn't deem it necessary to use that capability for meetings. S.J. sat on the creaky bed and flicked through the news, looking at the adult world through adult eyes for a change. It was odd not to be surrounded by lost teeth and simple math problems. Teacher shortage sweeps the nation. One district had gone dark last week when a group of machines number 342 through 368, summarily punished, simultaneously detached in protest. It's like they really don't care, you know, Alan Barnett from Arendelle said. They don't care that we're out here trying to take the best care of our kids, and they're leaving us in the lurch. For what? They have their jobs to do just like the rest of us. Our kids are the future, and, and they just don't care. Ungrateful old bat, S.J. muttered, unconsciously wincing in expectation of the blaring sensor alarm. Little voices didn't say naughty words, even when administration was annoying. The next morning, S.J. signed in to find a message from the parent or legal guardian of number 15, Thomas Dreyer. Tommy's been acting up. We just moved, had to change districts, lost all his friends. Just wanted you to know. He's really a good kid. Tommy cried at two plus two. The little voice didn't blame him. Math was arguably not as immediately important as losing your friends. Still, learning metrics didn't take that into account. By the next week, the machine was flashing out warnings about Tommy's poor grasp of math, psychological upheaval, remedial tutoring. F*** off, S.J. muttered, muting herself from twenty-nine little minds. Number twenty-six, Robert Huon had a hangnail and couldn't focus. A bad one that bled when he poked it, and he poked it a lot. Go tell your mommy, the little voice said. But Bobby's mommy was busy. Bobby's mommy worked long hours and came home tired. Bobby didn't want to tell his mommy because he knew she'd sigh in that way that made him feel bad. It's not your fault. She's not mad at you. Contrary to what S.J.'s training had told her, Bobby didn't believe the little voice, and the little voice didn't have fingers to help him. Physical assistance hinders a child's development and ability to fulfill their own needs. They need the confidence of achievement and self-reliance. S.J. had been enthralled with such forward thinking, Now she just wanted a pair of nail clippers. She sent off another mental memo asking administration to please contact the parent and or legal guardian of number 26, Robert Huon, about scheduling a quick conference call or maybe just reviewing the basic instruction manual on physical care and maintenance. She received a prompt reply. The work you do is important, and we take these matters seriously. All memos are addressed in the order they are received. You are currently 349 in line. Be the little voice of change. A red warning light flashed, 29 connections disappearing. Anger levels detected. An angry voice leads to an angry child. SJ took three deep breaths and 29 lives flickered back on. Her heart wrenched when she felt the dismay and worry some of them had felt when she'd vanished. 
Theo had spilled his juice and was wiping it up with a sock. Good work being resourceful, the little voice said. Now, remember last week when we learned how to use the laundry machine? SJ was wrestling a giant metal menace of data and flashing lights. Number five, Abigail Sims did not need extra help. Abby was bored and curriculum standards didn't allow for variations, so yes, she spent a lot of time reading and SJ couldn't understand why that was a demerit. Theo, no, Joe, no, Sammy. Extra lessons, stomach ache, fever. Yes, number 15, Thomas Dreyer. Tommy, he hated Thomas, was still underperforming in math. He just needed more time. Remedial intervention predicted. He just needed a hug. Numbers 30 through 35 had popped into her head, and she was trying to catch them up. What had their last teacher taught them? Nothing? She tried to be patient, remembering her own students still forgot things she knew she'd told them at least ten times, but number 30 through 35 didn't want to listen. They wanted number 162 back. SJ wondered vaguely where number 162 had gone. Her arm throbbed, and she didn't look down at the track marks. More districts had gone black last week. Commissions hadn't been that bad. But she couldn't go. Not now. The machine had become a long metal umbilical cord. What would they do without the little voice? The metal box, the long hours, it didn't matter. She could sleep here. Force herself through the tubes to help them grow. They mattered these twenty-nine little microcosms, what would they do without the little voice? S.J. muted herself and sobbed. He just needed a f***ing hug. Unmute. Reassure. Remind. A red light flashed. Blue. Green. Red. Yellow. Flash. 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 The engineer in the flat blue jumpsuit was eating a sandwich when the door to the maintenance area slid open, and a programmer wearing a red jumpsuit leaned in. 208 needs a hose. The engineer frowned, reluctantly set down his sandwich, and flicked on the monitoring screen. Why? What happened? Burned up. Another one? Jesus. He snorted. Where do they find these people? He finished eating, licking his fingers, before he grabbed the hose and dragged it behind him to clean out 208.
Today's episode of Tiny Tales was written and narrated by R. E. Rule. Mixing, music, and production by Frank Narat. Additional production by Matthew Ferrandino. If you enjoy our show, please rate, subscribe, and tell your friends about us. Join us on Patreon for as little as $1 per month to gain exclusive access to the Tiny Tales soundtracks. Visit us at tinytalespodcast.com for details. Thanks for listening.